Y'all turn to Matthew chapter 4. A couple of weeks ago, my... Um, I have a or had a cousin that she um she struggled with addiction and and things from the time she was 14 until I mean she was 41 years old so um a long time but for about six months um was the longest stretch she'd had of being clean and um so the last six months she's been clean and it was because um she had um made some drastic changes to her environment and um she um she moved in with my uncle who was not going to allow anybody around that um from her past and um and then she didn't have access to a vehicle and she didn't go anywhere so she kind of locked herself in because she in order to get the medication that she needed to survive then she had to be clean and they tested her every month and so for the last six months she's been clean and um and then two well yeah and then and which is great and then two weeks ago on saturday night she went to bed and she just didn't wake up and so which you know that's what i, I said at her memorial service is, is that we you know she went out she went out on an upswing she went out doing better and I hope I can say that. And she, um, um, but y'all just stay in prayer for her son. He he came to church with Brant like pretty much the whole summer. And um, but we had a memorial service here, and you know, basically I had, I'm sitting here with um two two distinct groups of people. I have some people that have been in church their whole life. I have some that I don't know if they've ever been to church. And if they have, I don't know that they've heard right. Whatever they've heard about God, I don't know that they've heard right. And um, I really, you know, I used it as an opportunity because my her dad, my my uncle, he um, I had him cornered, and I had the mic, and he couldn't go anywhere, and I could tell him the gospel, and that was um, that was the positive out of that but it would um but you know out of the two groups though you can tell um when you're speaking in front of people and things you kind of get a feel for what's happening and things and you know that it's that people that don't know god or that they don't know anything about god or they 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 have limited knowledge sometimes they're easier to communicate with than people that think they know everything and so you have to be careful whenever you think you've got it all figured out. Um, because if you're, if you're in that place, then that means that you're in a place where your mind can't be renewed. Because it says to renew your mind every day. And the reason is, is because if we default, we're going to default to, to, to lies. And so we have, to, we have to renew our mind all the time. And um, that's kind of the, the background. And we'll get to more of that in a minute. But in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, it says... When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, and the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, um, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned light has dawned and so from that time Jesus began to preach and say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand Galilee is where the whole revolutionary kingdom began okay Jesus was born in Bethlehem but after his birth his family fled to Egypt to get away from King Herod and then after the death of King Herod they moved to they moved to Galilee to the town of Nazareth and there he lived for 30 years um don't know how quiet his life was or how remarkable it was up through that time but he grew up in a very um politically strained time it was um you know they were under roman occupation um about seven miles away when he was a boy about seven miles away in a little town of um Sephar Sephoris, S S E P P H O R I S. it um there was an uprising where they tried to come against the romans 
and it did not end well for them. The, the Jews were crushed, and there were 2,000 Jews crucified. And that will, that will do a lot to deter a future revolution. But at this time, in, at this time, you know, along, along these, these Galilee is ready for a re revolution at this time, it, it revolutionary change again. They're, they're getting ready. It's, it's all brewing, okay? So at this time, John the Baptist is out, in the, is out, you know, preaching a message of repentance. And there's a lot goes into that. But Jesus, he goes and, he goes and participates in this public act of repentance. Then for 40 days and nights, he's in the wilderness. And then he goes back to Nazareth, grabs all of his belongings, whatever he has, and he, and he moves to Capernaum. And the reason, I guess, is later on we find out that he says a prophet is without honor in his hometown. And so he must have known he couldn't start his ministry there. And so he ends up in Capernaum, but he, then he began to start preaching. And whenever he preached, his whole thing was, was that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, meaning that the time has come that we have to rethink everything. The time has come that, that we, have to, we have to rethink because God's government from heaven is right here and it's within reach. Um, you know, to rethink something, it's not just to rethink it. It's not to ponder it. It's not, but to rethink something, it's to re repent is to rethink something that totally changes the course of your life. That's Repentance. When you totally you change your thought process to something that totally you know totally transforms your life and sends you in another direction, he is saying, "Look, the time is now. It's within our grasp." Okay, now the kingdom of God is the government of God. It's the rule of God. It's the reign of God. In Mark and Luke, it talks about the kingdom of God. In Matthew, it's um, written primarily to to Jewish. To Jewish people and so they had a reverence for the name of God so they didn't use God they wouldn't say they wouldn't say God by name and so in Matthew it's written kingdom of heaven unfortunately what's happened is is that there's a people have taken that kingdom of heaven and they've made it into kingdom in heaven and that's not what it says. It says the kingdom of heaven. And it's the answer to the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's the kingdom of God here. It's the kingdom of heaven here. And so um, you don't, we don't wait to go to heaven to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God, if you go through and you start trying to figure out, like, what is the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus was very, um, he was interesting with how he described the kingdom of God. Because he had always, it was like all of these different things, right? The kingdom of God is like somebody who lost a coin. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. And it's all these different pictures that he's given. But the kingdom of God is basically what the world would be like if God was in charge. So think about that. What if God were in charge? What if God were in charge of, of the nations? What things exist now that he would say, we're not doing that anymore? What things aren't in place now that he would say, yeah, we're going to do something about this? So what is, if, the, if God were in charge and God were, God were to rule things, that's, the king, that's what the kingdom of God. So, you know, what would he prioritize? Would he prioritize armies or hospitals? You know? had a great answer in Sunday school. They said neither, and that's true. I mean, why would you need a hospital if God was in charge and, and everyone was healed? So it's like, so the crazy thing is, is that Jesus was announcing that God was coming onto the scene to rule. And when he said the kingdom of God is at hand, it meant the kingdom of God, the reign of God, the rule of the government of God is coming right now. And Jesus claimed that God was establishing heaven's government through what he was doing. Now, God's government arriving in the world right now God establishing his own government and it's despite the presence of all the other ones but what did it look like well the kingdom of God looked like this every time Jesus forgave a sinner 
every time he healed a sick person, every time that he went, every time he fed people, that was the kingdom of God. And that's what it looks like. In Matthew 4, 23, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. So the gospel is the kingdom of God. And you know that gospel means good news. The gospel is the good news of the kingdom of God. It's the politics of heaven being implemented among those who would receive it. Now, the gospel is not, pri- is not primarily about going to heaven when you die. It's, it's, there, there's some things that we could, we could make that into, but when Jesus says the kingdom of God, that is never what, that's not what he's saying. He's not talking about whenever you, punch your, you cash your ticket in that I get into heaven. He's talking about a kingdom that is present right now. Now, he's going to be the new boss, and he's not going to do things the way that, other, that the other kings have done. He's not going to be like Nebuchadnezzar. He's not going to be like Caesar Augustus. He's not going to be like Alexander the Great. In, in Jesus' time, it was Caesar Tiberius, um, but Jesus is not like any of them at all. He brings not the kingdom of man, not the kingdom of dominion, not the kingdom of power, not the kingdom of, of just man power. He brings the kingdom of God. And if you want to know what it looks like what God was, when God rules the world, take a look at what's happening around Jesus everywhere he goes. Because what's happening around Jesus everywhere he goes, he's bringing the kingdom. And so whatever is happening around Jesus, that's what the kingdom of God looks like. Sick people get well. Sinners are forgiven. Outcasts are invited to the table to eat. Everybody has enough. That the, now, whenever you say that the kingdom of God is coming, when Jesus, in that time, whenever he says the kingdom of God is coming, you understand that this was not good news to everyone. I mean, you say the kingdom of God is here. The, the, the Romans did not think it was good news. That's right. Neither did the Pharisees, neither did the Sadducees, and neither did the Jewish leaders who had power at the time. So it was not good news for everyone. Um, you know, the Pharisees were okay for a revolution. They wanted that. They just didn't want it through him. They thought that the revolution would come through the way that they had been doing things. And at this point, the Pharisee movement was about 150 years old. And the way that they went about, the way that they went about bringing their revolution was, was to shame sinners. That was, their, that was their thing. So whenever their Messiah came, obviously he was, he was going to come shaming sinners. So Jesus was totally disqualified from this because he looked nothing like them. They had a zeal for God, but they were, they were unwilling to rethink anything. Now, and this kind of brings me to the, to the meat of it. And, and I want to say that um, in John 3, verses 1 through 13, um, it talks about Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus is a, an absolute understated hero of the Bible Nicodemus and, and we could read it in John 3 but Nicodemus is a Pharisee he's not just a Pharisee he's called the teacher he's called the teacher of the Pharisees he's identified as that and so like he's not just any Pharisee that grew up with the movement he is a Pharisee that teaches the other Pharisees how to be better Pharisees now now you know, the Pharisees were a movement that was started in a take back Israel for God. You know, and when they do that with rules, that's, that's how they went about doing it. Now, Nicodemus lives in Jerusalem. He, he is a part of the council in Jerusalem of the Sanhedrin, which is partly made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, and they did not like each other, kind of like Democrats, Republicans. It was just the same thing. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling, council, the ruling council, and of course it was subordinate to Rome, but he was over all of these Jews, and, um, or the, the council was over all of these Jews. So he hears that Jesus is on the scene, and he's going to hear that, that, that he's engaging in all kinds of, of provocative things. I mean, like, like he was going about saying, your sins are forgiven you, as if he had the power to do that. He is going about healing people he's going about 
eating with notorious sinners. He is not just, you know, and that was a, just a no-no for the Pharisees. I mean, it was all about cleanliness. It was all about the rules, the rules, the rules. And Jesus is going and inviting people that have been totally, like, kicked out of their, kicked out of their church, out of the synagogue, and Jesus is going and eating with them and sitting at the table with them and telling them that their sins are forgiven and all of these things. Well, Nicodemus, in his mind, and what he knows about the law is, is that he knows that that excludes Jesus from being, from being the Messiah that they're looking for. The thing that he couldn't get around was, was the miracles. And so he's a smart guy. He knows that he can't, like his colleagues kind of got around this. Whenever he's, you know, they hear about all the healings and stuff, his colleagues don't have an explanation. So they say Jesus is doing it because he has the power of the devil. Nicodemus is smarter than that and understands that the devil can't heal anybody. He's, he's, just not, he's not in the business of taking away something that's bad. And so, like, he understands this, and, he, and it, it, make, it brings him to a crossroad, which I find interesting because, like, you know, Nicodemus being this expert Pharisee and then later on Saul being this expert in the law, that all of their knowledge and all of their learning was taken the wrong way, but Jesus flipped it. In both situations, he flipped it. And he, and he ends up taking all of that stuff that was, all of that stuff, and making it like, hey, this is how I prove, you know, you, all that knowledge you have in your head is how I'm going to prove to you that I am who I say I am. But anyway, but in Nicodemus's case, he's going around, and, but he wants to meet with Jesus because he can't come to a place, I think, and I want to explain to you something. Jesus is a man in his early 30s at this time. Nicodemus is 70. 70 years of theology is getting rocked. 70 years of learning is getting, is getting totally, totally challenged. I work with old people every day. Changing someone's mindset is a miracle. It's the only way it can happen. When you talk about days and months and years of the same way of thinking over and over again, even though they may have learned wrong, it becomes a concrete in them. And it is very hard. And without, and I'm just telling you, don't waste your breath unless the Spirit of God is on it. Like when the Spirit of God is on it, like in, 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 God will give you that opportunity, but it, the Spirit of God has to be on it for you to be able to present to them that they can hear things. Because in Nicodemus's case, he meets with Jesus by night. He can't do it during the day. He's a prominent figure, and the things that he's wanting to ask Jesus, he does not want to ask in front of everybody else. Because the things he's having trouble with are things that they've already excluded Jesus from. So he goes... So he goes to Jesus, and he's talking to him, and, and Jesus tells him, said, you know, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, like, you ain't, you're not going to be able to hear me right. You're not going to perceive this correctly. Now, Nicodemus is not dumb. Whenever he says, like, and, and we know the story, and whenever he says, like, can a man be born again? Can a man return to his mother's womb? He's not saying that he literally thinks that he's going to go back to his mother's womb. He knows exactly what Jesus is saying. He knows exactly what, he is not a dumb man. He knows exactly what's going on. Because every time he heard about a miracle, it was chiseling at his heart. He knew. He was already in the process, and he knew it. But he said, can a man be born again when he's this old? In other words, can I really rethink everything this old? Can I really do it? And I just, you know, and you fast forward the story, and Nicodemus, we find Nicodemus as a part of the Sanhedrin defending Jesus when he's being, when he's being condemned, to be, condemned to die. We find Nicodemus at the crucifixion with another member of the council, Joseph of Arimathea, that they 
he spends a large sum of money to pay for Jesus' body because Nicodemus understood Jesus was a king. And he paid for Jesus to have a king burial. Out of his own, out of his own money. And at the cost, I'm sure, of his reputation. But he was able to rethink everything. He was able to go back, to, to, to go back and have that place of repentance. The thing now. Um, in this I, I want to do something here and I want to talk about something and it's um, I used to whenever I'd work with my patients and if they're going through something like you know I, I mean I have you know I have two right now that in the last week they've been diagnosed with cancer and you know but I deal with people that are that are going through stuff and you know, whenever you hear something like cancer, it puts you at a crossroads. And I used to feel them out, like to go, like you know, because I wanted to know, like exactly what's my what's my game plan here, to like get around to the fact that you know I'm gonna circle circle the fence enough times, and I'm gonna find that way in where I can tell them, hey, Jesus will heal you. You know what I mean? Like it's, but then I just kind of came to a place. I I just don't have that kind of time. I got it. And I just, and I pray about it, and in the first meeting, I will always have an opportunity. It will always happen. He, it, the door always opens, and I just go through it. And I don't try to get their background. I don't try to get what, they're, what I think that they know. I don't get with it. I mean, I don't, I, I don't try to, I don't strategize it. I just play it. I mean, I shoot from the hip. And, I, and listen, and if you heard me say it to some people, if you heard what I present to them to some people, you might go, man, that's not churchy at all. Well, at the moment, it's the way they hear. You know, Paul said, I became all things to all men. And so you, you can't, I can't talk the same way to a 75-year-old retired welder as I do to a 75-year-old secretary. It's not the same. And so, um, but here's what I present to them. And I don't know who it's for, but it's somebody here today. And, I just, and I, I'm just going to present to you the way I present to somebody. And, um, because I'm trying to establish the fact that God's good. My goal is, is that they understand that God's good and that God didn't do this to them. They're not being punished for something. They're not failing at something and God just couldn't take it anymore. They haven't done anything to where it's like, I'm, I'm trying to establish the fact that they are still within God's hand and they're still at a point where they, where they can be saved, healed, delivered. And so um, what I'll tell them is, is I go, you know, I'll say it now, I'm going to, and I'll tell them, listen, I'll tell them what I, this is my line I use every time. I'll say, listen, I'm fixing to explain something to you. And I just want to know that you're thinking correctly. And I'm going to tell you that a years ago, my wife told me something that is absolutely true. And she said, "You ask me what time it is, and I tell you how to build a and you tell me how to build a clock." I over-explain. And I know this, and it's and it's it's true. But I tell them, bear with me. And you know, whenever you've heard something like cancer, you're all ears. You got their attention, man. I mean, they, I mean it's, but I say, in the beginning, and they're always like, oh, gosh. Like, he's really starting at the beginning. But I say, God, God made the world, right? He spoke the world into existence, and he spoke man into existence. And whenever he, when he made man, God said, let us make man in our own image, in, his, in, in our own likeness, and let him have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. Let him have dominion. He, so, he gave, so God gave man dominion. And by doing so, God really did give man dominion of the earth. So if God were to take control of the earth, 
he would violate his own word because he gave man dominion, which is why when man handed the key over, whenever Adam handed the keys over to the devil, whenever he gave, the, whenever he gave his power away, that's why God had to come as a man to take it back because man has dominion of the earth. He had to come as a man. And so that's why Jesus, that's why Jesus leaves heaven, and which is a whole other thing that, that God, that God is, that Jesus is living in heaven. He understands that he, what he's going to have to do, and he did it anyway. Because that's how much he loves us. That he loves us so much that he left streets of gold. He left perfect peace. He left everything to come down to get in the to get in the dirt with us to bring us back out. That's how much he loves us. Um, I'm gonna tell him like that you understand that like if by man having dominion, that God's not responsible for a hurricane. God's not responsible for day, for babies dying. God's not responsible for <clears throat> for grandmom getting getting an illness. God's not responsible for, for all of these bad things. And I'll tell them, I don't know what you I don't know what you know about God. But I can say without a question, He's better than you think. Because every day when you renew your mind, you find out He's a little better. He's a little better than you thought the day before. But I make sure that they understand that they didn't. They don't deserve this. Because whenever you're going through something, and look, it might be cancer, it might be something else, it might be relational, it might be whatever, but when you're going through something, you didn't necessarily do anything to make that, to make that, well, God didn't do anything, God didn't do anything. You might have done something to bring something, to, to bring something to the forefront, but God hasn't done anything to put you there. But he's more than happy to deliver you. That's what Dan was saying. It's his good pleasure. Now, you start talking about the goodness of God, and whenever you really think about how good he is, you'll make some people mad. Because they don't want God to be good. They want to know that people pay for their sins. They want to know that somebody's, they, they want to know that, man, I followed the rules my whole life. And I want to know that those people going out there and got drunk and having all, the, all that fun, I want to know that they're going to pay. And all that you're telling me all they got to do is pray a sinner's prayer, and they're 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 free to go. I say, well, they're a whole lot more free than you, brother. <laughs> it's um, but but I want somebody that's going through something to understand that they didn't do anything. But I also want them to know that there's a way out. Um, the other day I had a lady. She had a she had a tumor just removed off of her spinal cord. She for it was pressing at about T8, and so it was. It was pressing in, and they went in there, and it's just a long story. But basically, for a solid month, she's paralyzed, completely paralyzed. Like, you know, from right through here down, she's paralyzed. And it's just, it's, it's such a long story. But, ba but she's, so for a month, she goes with no muscle activity in her legs. Well, it doesn't take long for your muscles to atrophy and just to kind of go away. So then she has a tumor removed. They put me in there, and I've got to go get her stronger. Well, her right side is working when I get there. Her right leg. And she just keeps telling me, she keeps saying my paralyzed leg. My paralyzed leg, that leg will not work. And she's so frustrated. And um, and I told, and I, and I went through all of this and I explained it to her. And I explained it to her in a different way. And I said, you know, look, you know, you understand that God created the world by speaking it. And it says the power of life and death in the tongue. She's got Bible verses all over the walls. I know that she, this. I know that she's at least trying. And so I said, you know, look, you keep calling that a paralyzed leg, and you have the power to make it paralyzed. So you also have the power to wake it up. I said, so don't call it a paralyzed leg anymore. I said, I want you to close your eyes. And I said, don't ask me how this works, but it does. Close your eyes, and when it, I want you to see what that muscle would look like if it contracted. And, and it fired, and it and it scared me to death. <laughs> like I was like, I was like, whoa, because it, it happened so fast. And her sister's sitting there. She goes like, oh my gosh. Well, the lady's like, what? And he said, whatever you did, just do it again. And then she started getting a contraction, and so she's and she's been slowly getting better. But what I'm saying is, is like you know, you don't call yourself broken. Don't call yourself less than. 
Don't go all shucks, you know, well, I did this, well, I did that. Don't do that. Don't do that. God sees you as a victor. He sees you from a place of victory, not a place of being a victim. And so bring yourself out of it because he gave dominion to you. He gave dominion to me. And he said that, like, what you say, if you have those, if you believe those things, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed and you believe those things that you say and you believe it in your heart, you will have those things that you say. So say good things. Say good things about yourself. Say good things about everybody else because that's what the kingdom of God looks like. The kingdom of God looks like people getting better. The people of God looks like sinners getting forgiven. So forgive somebody. The kingdom of God looks like people getting to eat. So feed somebody. The kingdom of God looks like, looks like God's goodness. So be good to somebody. Damn, Lord, just I thank you, Lord, for this. For this, Lord, I just thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your peace. I thank you for your joy. Lord, I just thank you for the sacrifice that you, the sacrifice that you made. That you made that you made everything available to us again. That you restored us to a place that, as you are, so are we in heaven. That you restored us to a place of a right standing with you, so that so that we are empowered again, Lord. So that we are in, so that we have the power. And Lord, help us to recognize that power. Help us to recognize the opportunities that we have. Help, help us to change from where we are, that whatever we need to rethink about, that whatever we need to consider again, that we would consider it, that we would go from a different place, Lord, that from this day forward, we would just have a new, have a new found foundation, Lord. Something that where we think that you're, we, we know that you're better than, than you were yesterday. We know that you're better than, better than you were last year, Lord. Lord, and that we would portray that to, your, to the world, Lord. That we would be your light, your, we would be your light in the darkness. That, that, Lord, that we would be sent forth, Lord. That we would bear fruit. That we would be your disciples. I just thank you, Lord, for, for, for touching hearts and changing lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. That's just a good word. That's a good word. Why don't you stand? And I really believe that word has set, a, set the atmosphere for healing. We'll be a ministry team. I want you to come down. And I want you, if you uh, are battling with an infirmity or you need prayer, I believe that word has set it up for God to heal you today. We're going to believe for that. Uh, it's, it can't be explained any better than that. You might have to rethink something, but it can't be explained any better than that. Your rethinking should bring you to a different conclusion than what you had when you started to rethink. You should conclude, God is good. He didn't put sickness on me. Somebody said the other day on Facebook, God gave me pain to develop me into a better person. I said, no, he didn't. He uses pain. That's on you anyway. He uses it for good, but don't confuse it with he gave it to you. I don't know how you can explain it any better than what Bill did. So I'm going to release you, Father, in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, speak. If there's a heart here that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we pray you come down also. And let's just go out of here in victory today. In Jesus' name, amen. God